My name is Jeanette. I am a Christian and I love Jesus with all my heart. I love my children and I love the people of my country, the Central African Republic. There are both Christians and Muslims in my country and we lived as neighbors as I worked to reach them for Christ. But my hope for a peaceful life didn't last. Our village was ambushed by the Islamist attackers. Guns started firing and we started running as fast as we could into the bush. All the Christians in my village were killed or driven into hiding. I fled with my children. We didn't even have time to put on our shoes or clothes. Attacks like these have been targeting Christians in the Central African Republic for eight years and continue today. Churches and missionary stations that have been built over decades have been destroyed along with Christians' homes that have been burnt to the ground. In one area, the only structures that remained were the metal roofs of two churches. Thousands of Christians have spent years in makeshift temporary shelters far from their homes as the violence and instability continues. Delivering desperately needed help to displaced Christians often means overcoming impassable roads, using cargo planes, trucks, motorcycles, bicycles, and even canoes. With God's help, supplies are making it to Christians scattered throughout various camps. Today, Jeanette and more than 30,000 Christians in the Central African Republic have been driven from their homes all because of their faithfulness in maintaining a witness for Christ in majority Muslim areas in the face of severe Islamist violence. These courageous believers, our Christian brothers and sisters in the Central African Republic, have shown God's love and forgiveness to their persecutors. They continue to faithfully follow the Lord and trust Him to meet their needs. This time the children are res released to go to Kingdom Kids. Your teacher will meet you in the back if you are going. I think it's going to be Joe. You know, it's one thing uh, to pray for and talk about persecuted Christians. And it's another thing to see them. An image or a video or a picture. For most of our brothers and sisters around the world, suffering for Jesus is a daily reality. It's what they do. It seems so foreign to us being that we live in a country where we still, for the time being, have religious freedom. It's hard for us to compute or connect with that. I mean, can you imagine either the government or religious zealots burning down your home or our church simply because we profess faith in Christ. The reason we can't relate to these people is because we've never suffered the way they do. We've never endured the kind of opposition that they endure every day to Christianity. I mean, think about this. Our persecuted brethren around the world, they're not attacked because they're criminals. They're not attacked because they uh, cause civil unrest. They're not attacked because they use violence against others to force them to believe what they believe. They are attacked for loving people, 
for spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and making Him known, calling people to believe in Him and turn from their sin. That is why they are attacked. They are attacked for trying to see people freed from the sin that is so destructive in their lives. And yet they're hated for this. And they're persecuted. It's been estimated about 70 million Christians have been killed for their faith since Jesus began the church in the first century. 70 million. Many think it's higher. That's just an estimate. About two-thirds of that 70 million, that's about 46 million, have been killed in the last 120 years alone. That means beginning in the 1900s, 46 million Christians. Now, even though the number of people being killed for their faith has somewhat lessened over the years, there are still about 100,000 Christians killed every year since 1990. 100,000. Why does the world hate Jesus so much? And why do they hate his followers? Why this opposition? Being that the world is becoming increasingly hostile to biblical Christianity, we need to know the answer to that question. We need to understand why does the world hate Jesus and his followers? And we need to, not, to know not only so that we can be ready when it comes here and I think it's coming, but so that we will respond the way Jesus wants us to respond. So if you have your Bible, please turn to John 15. And we will be considering the issue of why the world hates Jesus this morning. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer those. You can text those in. The number is in the bulletin. We're in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. This is what is written for us. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They have hated me without a cause. Lord Jesus, we want to understand your words here. We want to understand why the world hates you and hates us who follow you. So that we would not be surprised, so that we would be prepared. And so that we might respond the way you want us to respond. So we ask the Holy Spirit to be our guide and teacher this morning in your word. Amen. So when we look in verse 18 where Jesus says, if the world hates you, he is not saying that there may be a time when the world won't hate the disciples. He's not saying if. In fact, it's probably better translated as since. It is a conditional statement, but he is assuming that it's true. Probably better to be translated since the world hates you. Now, the reason we can say that is because what's said later, beginning in verse 20, that the world will persecute the church, that the world hates Jesus and the world will does hate us. When Jesus references the world, he's speaking of the evil system made up of people who are enslaved by their sin and who are led by none other than our enemy, the devil, or Satan, as the Bible calls him. The world is controlled by Satan. We've already heard Jesus make this statement. Turn back a couple of chapters. In chapter 12, verse 31, he refers to him as the ruler of this world. 
He uses that same title again in chapter 14, verse 30. That Satan is the ruler of this world. Now we have seen up to this point in Jesus' ministry that he had been hated. Right? He had come to make God known to announce that he was the Messiah, the one in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Savior that would come to Israel to save them from their sin and to save the world that is the nations from their sin. And they hated him for it. Right? The religious elite opposed him. They slandered him. They said that the miracles that he had performed among them were by the power of the devil. And at this time, in chapter 15, they are seeking to kill him. They want to murder him. Why? Because they don't want to lose their power and their prestige and the money that they gain from it. They're seeking to murder Jesus at this time. And remember... Jesus said, why did they do this? Why did they hate him? Why did they oppose him so vehemently? It's because they are like their father. John chapter 8 in verse 44. They are like their father, the devil. That's why they hate Jesus. It's interesting that the religious people are considered part of the world. That's interesting, right? Because they're the ones who claim to be godly. They're the ones who claim to follow the Lord and to be his people. And yet all of those, whether they're religious or not, who do not receive the God of the Bible through his son are enemies of God. They are the ones who are boastful. They are arrogant, conceited, lovers of self and lovers of money rather than lovers of the only true God through Jesus Christ. This is the world. And these religious were part of that world. They were part of the system that hated Jesus and who hates those who follow him. They hated him when he lived here on the earth. And they still hate him as he rules from heaven. They are opposed to him. Now, if the disciples were of the world, Jesus tells us in verse 19, the world wouldn't hate them. They would be of the world and the world would embrace its own with open arms. They would not seek to persecute them. Nor would they desire to do so. Why? Because the world receives and embraces and celebrates its own. In fact, look on the screen. Paul said this in Romans chapter 1 verse 32. Speaking of those who live in rebellion against God, that is the world and the sinners that live in the world. And although they know the ordinance of God... That those who practice such things are worthy of death, meaning the sins that he enumerated in Romans 1. He says they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. You see that? The world embraces its own. A world of rebellion embraces rebels. It is engaged in active rebellion against God, and it loves those who also do like it does doesn't want to answer to God. The world hates God. It loves those who are in rebellion against God. But those who are enemies of God, it'll embrace. To them, the world, God is their enemy. This is what Paul means when he says they give hearty approval. Hey, if we have the common enemy that is God, then you are one of us. And they embrace them. However, disciples are not, out of the, not, not, are not of the world. They have been chosen out of the world. And it's not as though that they're better than those in the world, right? Because Jesus makes it very clear. I'm the one who chose you out of the world. I rescued you from the world. You were once part of it. So it's not as though you're better. It's not as though you are worthy. But you have been recipients of grace. Jesus rescued them from the corruption that was in the world as he has rescued us. He has revealed himself to us in the same way he did to them and saved us as he did to them from the evil that is in the world and rescues us from the judgment and wrath that's coming upon the world when Jesus returns. Jesus then says, even though you're not of the world, and even though they hate you, remember what I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. 
Now, he had said that, if you remember, in chapter 13. Again, reminding them that even though they are his friends, they are still his slaves and he is still their master. But in chapter 13, he used that phrase and said, a slave is not greater than his master when he was teaching the disciples how to be humble towards one another. Right? If I'm your master and I'm willing to wash your feet, then you should do the same to each other. Here he uses the same phrase, but he uses it in the context of, if I'm your master and they persecute me because they hate me, then they will do the same to you, you who are my servants and slaves. Why? Because you are mine and you represent me. They will persecute you. And this, why do they do that? Because they hate Jesus. Why do they hate Jesus? He tells us. Because he's the one who exposes their sin. Right? If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now that they have no excuse for their sin. He's not saying that they weren't sinners before he came, but what he is saying is that he had revealed himself to them and called them to believe in him and repent, and they refused. And they rejected it. They don't want to turn from their sin. And so they hate him. And when they see us, his followers, those who belong to him, those who are owned by him, they hate us too. Why? Because they are reminded that we who are not perfect, but who have been cleansed, who have been forgiven, we who strive to pursue righteousness in our lives because we know Jesus and love him and want to obey him, we too expose them in their own sin. And therefore, therefore they hate us for it the way they hate Jesus. Proverbs 29, 27 says this. An unjust man is, an abo- is abominable to the righteous. And he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. Those who are upright are abominable to the wicked. Why? Because it is the righteous, those who are God's people, when they see us, they are reminded that God is, right? Everyone knows that God exists. They may deny it. They may suppress that truth and unrighteousness as Romans chapter 1 verse 18 tells us. They know he exists and they are reminded that they answer to him and that he does exist when they see us, his people, following him. And they hate him and they hate us, right? When they suppress that truth and unrighteousness, it's kind of like a little kid who's being told what to do and they say, la, 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 I can't hear you, right? That's what sinners do. When they see us, they go, oh, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know. I don't want to answer to God. How dare you tell me that I have to answer him? How dare you, by your life and by your words, tell me that I must repent and believe in Jesus? When they're confronted by God's people, they are confronted by the living God. Not because we are perfect, but because we have submitted ourselves and our lives to the living God by faith, by faith in Christ. That's why they hate us. They can't do anything but hate us look at your screen romans 8 7 says this why do they hate us why are they in such active rebellion against god it's paul tells us because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward god it does not want to subject itself to the law of god for it is not even able to do so hostile they don't want to answer they don't want to be told what to do Those who continue in their sin hate God and hate Jesus and hate his disciples. When they when Jesus says that they do not know the one whom he has sent, he's not saying that they don't know who God is. They know that there is a God. Right. When he says the reason they do this is because they don't know me or they don't know my father. He's not saying that they don't know God exists. It's he's saying they don't have a relationship with him. They haven't submitted to him. They haven't placed their faith in him. They have no understanding of his heart or his desires because they reject him and they reject his word. In that sense, there is no knowledge of God. And it's not because it's God's fault, because Jesus says he had made himself known to them. So it's not as though, well, if only God would reveal himself to us and make himself known to us, then we would believe in him. That's not the case. He had revealed himself to them. And they rejected him. He had come and disclosed himself to them. So they are without excuse. However, the world's hatred of Jesus 
is not unexpected. It's not as though Jesus showed up and he's like, wow, I'm shocked. Right? Because he says, they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. Now, he's specifically speaking of the Jews, right? They're the first ones who rejected him, but the world that has rejected him is the same. They hated me without a cause. In other words, God sent Jesus as an offer of redemption by grace, not because they're worthy, but because he's good and he's loving, and they had no cause to reject him, and yet they rejected him anyway. He had said this would happen. Scripture had foretold this, right? Jesus quoted Psalm 69, 4 here. They hated me without a cause. Now, the truth of the world's hatred and rejection of Jesus was meant to be a warning to his disciples. And it's meant to be a warning to us. In fact, Jesus' words remind us to expect the world to hate us. You need to expect the world to hate you. The world that is hostile toward God, that rejects his son to the point that they use his name as a cuss word, is plain to see. I mean, you ever notice that? They don't use other deities or other faith systems as, you know, you don't hear, you know, oh, Allah. They don't use that as a cuss word. In fact, someone might, you know, kill you for that. But they say the name of Jesus is a cuss word. It's very evident in other parts of the world, as we have seen. In many parts of the world, whether it's the Central African Republic, whether it's Iran, whether it's China, whether it's North Korea, whether it's the Sudan, whether it's Laos, whether it's Vietnam, people are hated and persecuted, and it's intense. They're thrown in jail. Their houses are burned. They're murdered. Why? Because they hate Jesus. Now, one of the main reasons we don't have not endured this kind of hostility like we see in other parts of the world is because for two centuries... Our culture here in the United States has had the benefit of the church serving as a restraint against evil, right? Our country, our nation was founded by people, by men and women who feared God. Now, not all of them were Christians, but many of them were, and they were influential in establishing the law of the land. And it's for this reason we haven't endured the persecution that the rest of our brethren around the world endure. However, in today's culture, the world has rejected the church's influence. The world no longer views the church as vital to society as it once did in our nation. It has been slowly changing for decades. Even though the church still exists in our nation, according to the culture, it is not only no longer relevant, the culture is beginning to think that the church is a danger to society. Think about it. It is the church that champions the sanctity of life in the womb. We are the main proponents of pro-life. The the church's pro-life stance is a threat. Listen to this. The church's pro-life stance is a threat to our culture's God of sex that they worship. People want their licentious sex and don't want to pay the consequences of pregnancy. That's what abortion is all about. The mantra that the abortion protects the right for women to make choices over their own body is nothing more than a veil that covers the real reason, their desire to keep having sex whenever and with whomever they want and not pay the consequences. The pro-choice movement isn't concerned about women being raped. They're not concerned about the medical dangers that a woman faces when she's pregnant. Those cases are rare. They do happen, they're rare. That's not what their concern is, though. Their concern is all about sex. They want their sex, and they don't want anybody to tell them that they can't have it, and they don't want to live with the consequences with it. And the church church stands in the way. I mean, why do you think the left was so angry when the president appointed Amy Coney Barrett. Why do you think they were so mad? It's because they perceived that she was a threat, that she might overturn Roe v. Wade, God forbid, and that they would have to not be able to worship their God of sex. That's why they were so angry at her and her appointment. 
Biblical sexuality is another issue. It threatens the world's desire to be sexually free from God's law. The world not only champions the perversions of heterosexuality, what we've just talked about, adultery, fornication, but it also champions the perversion of what our culture uh, celebrates of homosexuality and gender dysphoria. The world doesn't want to follow God's design of male and female. The world doesn't want to follow God's design for physical intimacy between marriage, between a husband and a wife. We stand for what the Bible says, and we are a threat to this culture. We are a threat to its perceived freedom to sin however and whenever they want. And what's interesting is it's not as though the church uses force to compel people to believe or even to submit. We're not out there using violence. We're not out there using the power of the government to force people to submit to God's word. We're not out there doing that, are we? However, they still hate us. Why? Because they hate God. And the other reason the world hates us because we who follow Jesus are hated by the enemy, that is Satan. Satan hates Jesus and he hates us. Everything the devil does is in opposition to God. He hates God and he hates his followers. He is the one who influences and controls people with his lies. He is the one that keeps them blind and enslaved in their sin. It is true. People are guilty of their own sin. So I'm not saying, well, it's the devil's fault. However, the devil plays a major role in manipulating his own children with their own sin. You know, I believe the time is coming, and I said this earlier this week at our men's uh, dinner. The time is coming very soon when we, the followers of Jesus, will be openly persecuted in this country. I think it's coming. We've already seen examples of it. Whether or not Trump gets elected, it's still coming. Those people who hate us, they're going to continue. And eventually, whether they get it in this election, they're going to get what they want. You can't stop the momentum of the evil that is in the world. We are no different than any other nation that has existed in the history of human civilization. All civilizations eventually rebel against God, and eventually God gives them over to their own sin. And that's where we're at. The days are coming. It's going to get worse. We live in a time where good is considered evil and evil is considered good. Now, the reason Jesus warned his disciples is because he didn't want them to be discouraged when this persecution would come upon them. Think about it. From the very early days of the church, it has faced persecution. Stephen, the first martyr, was killed for telling people the truth. And he used their own scriptures to demonstrate that Jesus was the fulfillment of their scriptures. And they stoned him to death. And then James, John's brother, was beheaded for his faith in Christ. Then after him, all the apostles, including Peter and Paul, were all killed except for John for their faith. And since then, as I, millions have died for their faith. At least 70 million. The world hates us because it hates Jesus, and we need to expect it. However, we don't need to be discouraged. Jesus considered the persecution of his people as a personal attack on him. This is what he told Paul when he saved him. Acts 9-4, put it on the screen. And and, and this is when Paul, this is before he saved, and he is actively seeking believers to incarcerate them and to persecute them. And Jesus blinds him on the road to Damascus. And it says, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see that? Jesus viewed the hatred that was towards his people as towards him. He takes it personal. It's not as though he is unaware. And because he takes it personal, because he takes it personal, means that he doesn't leave us abandoned. Since the world hates Jesus, ask yourself this. Why would you ever want its approval? Why would we who follow and submit to and believe in and love Jesus, why do we want the world's approval? We shouldn't. 
Should we? If they hate Jesus, who cares about the world's approval? Something to think about. So what should our response be to this hatred? Should we stockpile our food? Get a bunch of ammo? Bunker down? And start picking them off as they come for us? Is that what we should do? Should we respond in kind with hatred and words of hate? No. Jesus tells us what to do. Look at verse 26. He says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering a service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have spoken to you. So that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. You know how Jesus wants us to respond? He speaks of the Holy Spirit. And he tells us that the Holy Spirit will enable us to overcome the world's hate. That's what he wants us to do. The reason Jesus mentioned the helper in this context, remember who the helper is. He's the one who comes alongside to to encourage, to strengthen, to exhort, right? We've heard that he has come to help us to be obedient to Christ earlier in chapter 15 and in chapter 14. Here, he tells us that the helper comes to strengthen and encourage us to live in a world that hates us. We are not alone. We cannot face the hatred of the world alone. We need the very power of God that is available to us in the person of God, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us. And he is not just calling us to withstand the hatred. He's calling us to speak into that hatred, the very truth of Christ and Him crucified. I mean, notice how He refers to Him as the Spirit of truth. He did that for a reason. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspired men to write the Scriptures. His inspiration means, as we know from the Scriptures, that it wasn't just men who wrote down the Scriptures, but men moved by the Holy Spirit wrote the Scriptures as they spoke from God. He is the source of the Bible, and He is our helper. The reason we will need Him is because we need Him to help us to respond to this hatred. Not only to encourage us, but to strengthen and embolden us to tell people who hate Jesus that Jesus is their only hope. That He is the only answer to the sin that plagues their lives. Jesus says of the Holy Spirit, He will testify about me. How will He do that? Through us. See where Jesus says, you will testify also? I believe that phrase is actually a command. Notice how if you, in your translation, the word will, if you have the same one as mine, is in italics. That's because that word will is not in the original. Usually, when you say something is going to happen, you say, well, when I walk down the street, I will see the car coming, right? We're talking of something that will happen in the future. And things in the Bible are written that way. It's called the future tense, right? And you usually translate it as something that will happen, not something that's already happening. However, this verb here that that says we will testify or you will testify, there is no will. It's literally, you are testifying. But that doesn't fit the context. But that form is also the exact same form in which the Greek language uses commands. And context dictates whether it's just a regular verb or a command. And I believe it's a command. In other words, I believe what Jesus is saying, and you must testify also. Or I command you to testify also. In other words, Jesus is commanding his disciples and us to go and testify about him. 
And I'm not alone on this, by the way. There are many other Bible scholars who believe it's a command. What this means, think about it. What this means is that the very thing, the very reason as to why the world hates us, Jesus is commanding us to go and do. In other words, they hate us because they hate Jesus. And Jesus is saying, go and tell them about me. You must go and testify about me. You must be my witness. And you must do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, Are these words I've written to you so that you won't stumble. In other words, I don't want you to think like because they hate you as though I have abandoned you. They're going to hate you the way they hated me. But how did Jesus respond to the hatred? He spoke the truth to them. He was kind to them. He was gracious to them. He offered himself to them. Not everyone received, but some did, right? Which he said earlier, what does he say? He said earlier, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. That's a, that's a, a glimmer of hope. Like, hey, not everyone's going to hate you. There are going to be some who get saved. There are going to be people who are rescued. That's why you go out. The original disciples, he says, you will be outcasts. In their culture, it would be kicked out of the synagogue. And indeed, they were heavily persecuted from the Jews. In fact, the Jews thought their persecution was an act of worship. In fact, you can read in some of the old Jewish writings that the person who persecutes an unbeliever, what they do is the same thing as someone who comes and gives his offering on the altar. In other words, persecution and worship at the altar are both worship, according to these people. Even though they hate us, Jesus commands and expects us to respond the way he did in love. He wants us to make the gospel known to them, to call them to believe in Christ, to turn from their sins. He is the only hope for the world. Global peace is never going to happen. Greed, jealousy, and lust are never going to go away. These and all sins that are intensely destructive to our lives cannot be done away with apart from Jesus. He's the only one. He's the only one who can solve these issues. Remember, we don't have a race or a systemic race or inequality issue. That is not what is systemic in the human race. What is systemic? Sin. Sin is systemic and only Jesus can overcome sin. So this hatred that they have towards God and towards His Son and towards we who follow Him can only be overcome through the Gospel as we proclaim it. Which is what our response should be. Even though the world hates us, we are still commanded to make Jesus known. That is our response. This is our mandate. This is why we are here. This is why Jesus came. He didn't come so that we could just live a good, peaceful, moral life here and now he came that we might live life abundantly tell others about him so that we would live with him forever free from sin free from the curse free from the dominion of satan and the way he overcomes sin in the people's in in the people's lives the way he does that is he makes himself known through us his people That's what he does. We live in a perverse world. In fact, look what Paul says in Philippians. He says, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. You see that? The world is dark, it's perverse, it's crooked, it's fallen, it hates God, and yet we are called to be the lights in this dark world. And in order to be the light, it requires that we not only proclaim Christ and Him crucified, but we live lives of holiness. I mean, why would anyone believe our message if we don't live like we believe it? Or how will anyone know who to believe in if we don't tell them why we live the way we do? Both is required to be the light. We need to live and proclaim the gospel to be lights in the world. Why? It's because we want to be like Jesus. 
We want to follow his example. We want to tell others who are still enslaved by their own sin and the devil that they can be free if they believe and repent from their sin. And speaking of his conversion, we'll put it on the screen, Acts 26. This was Jesus speaking to Paul about what he would do. That he would open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That's what Jesus wanted Paul to do. That's what Jesus did. Paul writes of it again in 2 Timothy 2. That they, people who are in the world, may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive to do his will. That's why we proclaim Christ. The devil hates God and he hates us. And by the way, he hates his own people. He wants them to suffer. He wants them to be in misery. He promises them everything. But sin never delivers. It always lets down. It always costs more than you want to pay. He doesn't do that out of love. He hates them as well. Yet we are here to be the light in the dark. I don't know, think about this. Maybe the reason we don't see more persecution or more opposition to us is because we never open our mouths about Jesus. Maybe. Ask yourself, what is most important to you? What is life all about? Is it really just living a peaceful life, having a great job, having a lot of things, eating great food, going on great vacations, having a family? Is that what life's all about? I mean, if that's what life's all about, it only lasts maybe 60 to 80 years. But that's not what life's all about. To the believer, that's not what is most important. This life is but a sliver of the rest of eternity. What's most important is, do we know God and are we making Him known to other people who don't know Him? Why? Because He is most important. He is most worthy. He deserves for us not only to live for Him, but to call others to live for Him as well. Time is coming when we will need to depend on each other more as we face the anger of the world as it continues to put us in its crosshairs. You know, that's how our brethren survive around the world. They depend on each other. It's going to be different. It's going to be different. We're used to being able to just care for ourselves and care for our own needs. And yet we might need to go acts too. We might need to hold things in common. Why? Because we love each other. And we see needs and we may need to meet those needs. We can't do this alone and by God's grace, we're not alone. We are together. We are in the minority. We are hated, but we will respond the way Jesus does and the way he did in love. Now, this message that Jesus gives, it's not meant to be to cause fear in us. Right? We don't need to be afraid. Our life is secure. The worst they can do to us is kill us, and then we're with Jesus, and then it gets better. And then you don't have to deal with Antifa or those who hate Jesus. You don't need to be discouraged as though we're fighting a losing battle. Look at we talked about that. I don't want to spend a lot of time, with, but look at what, 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 what does Jesus say about those whom he has saved? He goes, I already chose you before the foundation of the world. In other words, Jesus is going to save people. He's not wringing his hands in heaven. So like, oh, man, I hope some of them believe in me. No, he knows who are going to believe in him because he chose them. Which what that means to us is as we proclaim him in a dark world, there are people out there who are going to get saved. But God uses us. To bring them to himself. Therefore, we must open up our mouth and tell them. Jesus saves. There will be some, who, as Jesus said, who will keep your word. Why? Because I've chosen them. We don't need to be discouraged. We don't need to be afraid. We're not fighting a losing battle. In the end, Jesus wins. And we are his. And he will keep us secure. And don't give in to this idea, well, man, I just hope the rapture happens really fast so we can just get out of here. 
That's going to happen. But until it does, we need to be faithful to proclaim Christ. Why? Because He is the one the world needs. May we be found faithful. Amen? So in summary, we say this. A world enslaved by sin will always hate Jesus. Yet Jesus still saves sinners from the world when we make him known. We still make him known and he's still going to save people. We have one question. What is it? In the Greek or some other language, is the word martyr the root word for witness? Yeah, I believe it is um, Latin. I, I couldn't. I'm not sure of that, but yeah, I, I believe that's what it means. It means witness. So, I mean, when you speak of a, a martyr, that, that is those who have witnessed for Christ and have died for it, for that witness. So, yeah, that's a good question. Well, as the music team comes forward back onto the platform, we're going to prepare our, our hearts and our minds to worship Jesus through his table. And as we get ready for that, and I'll invite you here in a moment to come and take the elements. I'll remind you that if you are unable or have a hard time coming up to grab the elements, we will bring them to you. But for everyone else, please come either on this side or that side, grab the elements and go back to your seat. We will be singing a song while we grab the elements and then we'll celebrate the Lord's table together. But I want to remind you of something today as we sit and center ourselves on the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Jesus gave us this command as a gift to us to remind us what is to be at the center of everything we do and who we are. And it's redemption. It's the gospel. Jesus has left us here to do a job Right, We who have been saved, we are blessed, we are loved, we are forgiven, we are accepted. We have the promise of eternity with Him in heaven and no one can take that away. But may we adopt the heart of Jesus as we remember Him this morning and may we long to see others be just like we are. Do we love Jesus? Of course we do. And that's one way in which we can show Him that we love Him. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the instruction you give us. We know that the world hates you and it hates us because we love you and we follow you. We don't have the strength to face this kind of opposition, but thank you that you've given us your spirit who lives in us, who will empower us to be a witness to you, to be found faithful until you return. May we be different May others see how we respond in kindness and in gentleness, not in anger and vengeance when they hate us because they hate you. And may you use our lives and what we proclaim to save others as we proclaim the gospel to them. Jesus, as we take time to focus on your cross and what you did for us, may you be worshiped and may we do so in a worthy manner. Amen.